Okay. It says we're live. Let's make sure we get that notification we need to get to for Facebook. And we can kick off the old, there it is. There's that notification. That's what we're looking for, baby. That's what we're looking for. We're, we're, we're 15 to 20 seconds behind on the, uh, on the stream there. If you're catching it live. Uh, okay. So you guys know the drill. I got to leave some comments and I got to, uh, share this stuff around. So that's going to be the first couple minutes. Uh, yeah. So hang tight, hang tight, everybody. We're going to get through this, uh, together, this weird, awkward first couple minutes. Uh, if you want to, you can leave the stream or running, get yourself, uh, get yourself a drink, uh, get yourself a, a, a smoke break if you if you need it. Uh, get yourself, uh, I don't know, get yourself some juice. Do you, do you like juice? Are you a juice fan out there, people? Uh, if you are, grab one of those. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna drop some comments with some links to uh, to some of the the pertinent things that involve. Uh, me and uh, and then we're gonna share this around That's something that we do in the very beginning of all this stuff. We share these things around so if you would like to you can uh, you can totally hit that share button yourself and uh, And share this around so uh, You know pardon pardon the delay uh, I, This is this is part of being a, a one-man operation, you know, sometimes you just it's just it's just you doing all these things. And then sometimes Facebook decides that you're not a real boy uh, and it makes you feel real weird on the inside. It makes you feel real weird on the inside, you guys. So uh, pardon, the, pardon the delay on this. Um, I know radio silence is like a thing that people don't particularly like. So I'm gonna do my best to try to share stuff uh, think of think of groups that need to be the, this stuff needs to be shared into um, and then do that uh, and keep and try to keep you guys uh, mildly entertained in while I'm doing this sort of stuff like I said if you're watching and you're sticking around um, please do hit that share button uh, make sure that you uh, let some people know that we're doing this uh, because, uh, as, as we'll talk about, Facebook doesn't particularly care for, for, you know, a lot of the things that I'm addressing, uh, here on, on the, on the old channel, uh, make sure you're, you're subscribed to get notifications too. That'd be, that's a important thing. Make sure that you're, uh, uh, you, you are getting notifications from me because sometimes people don't get notifications from me that normally do. Uh, that is something that I have experienced on this platform as well. So, you know, just uh, keep your eye out for that fuckery because because it's existing. Um, I am uh, I, I, I as I do this, I'll I'll do the check in. If you're if you're um, new to the stream, I do a little check in about where I am on a mental and physical health, uh, physical health status. Is that a, is that a thing? Um, I'm okay. I kind of fucked up my shoulder today. <laughs> that hasn't happened in a little while. Uh, it hasn't happened in, in quite some time that I have like injured myself, uh, working out. Uh, so my shoulder's kind of sore and stiff. Uh, I did dips wrong. I, there, there's a park that I, or, or not a park, it's a track that I go to, and there is like this little machine that, not even a machine, it's just a thing I think that they use for like football practice or whatever. And um, yeah, you know, I, I, um, I use that. I, I, I am, uh, you know, I do, I do like the upward row and, and a modified push up, and then I do dips. Uh, to, you know, to do some body weight stuff while I walk the track and stuff. And I definitely fucking did it wrong. <laughs> I straightened myself out and I think I locked my shoulder at, and I uh, stressed it out in the, in the last, uh, in the last run there and kind of, kind of fucked it up. You guys kind of, kind of fucked it up. 
not it was not good it was not good uh so yeah that happened uh so my shoulders are a little sore other than that i'm doing pretty darn good i'm doing pretty darn good uh we're we're almost ready to 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 jump into some of the topics of the day that we are uh going to talk about here i'm going to invite some of the folks that i know pay attention and tune into the show and leave comments and uh all that uh all that fun good stuff there um the the show yesterday went really well uh the the citizen revolution show went really well we got one more next week and then we're we're, we're dipping into the the july shows uh there's two in july three in august because i'm i'm intermixing the uh providence friends festival as well and the uh, st louis french festival uh and those are all digital they're all going uh digital now so um you know uh yeah so i i didn't want to overdo it i didn't want to stress myself out uh too too much and go kind of crazy about it so i uh, i'm doing two in july three in august and then i'll probably continue to do them through fucking september as well because uh i don't particularly see live shows coming back anytime soon you guys uh sorry to say that but uh I do think that this digital format is is how we are going to be how touring performers are going to um, you know do do their thing going forward. I am not planning on touring at all this year, to be honest, and it's not because I don't want to. I very much fucking want to. Um, it's mostly because I can't, uh, and I will go into the a, a full detail of that. Uh, I'm working on a, a thing for my website about it and I'll, I'll go into a full detail about that. And I might do a little live stream about it as well. Uh, just, just the ins and outs of what touring involves. It just, it's not feasible this year. It's just not feasible this year. So, you know, um, uh, yeah, I just don't think it's, I just don't think it's going to happen. So this is sort of the way that, uh, you know, these live streams, my podcasts, the uh, uh, the virtual live stand-up comedy shows. Those are basically how I'm gonna how I'm gonna survive this year. How I'm gonna make money and uh, earn a living. And, and uh, uh, it is it is basically the the situation for a lot of different people uh, that are in the arts as well. So you know that is something. Uh, it sucks, but we we have to keep that in mind. And um, yeah. That is, that is just something that we have to deal with in our society. So uh, we're almost done. We're almost done with all the people that normally come and hang out with us when we do, when we do these things here. Sorry for this awkward time. Hope you guys are hanging in there. Because I like you guys. Okay. Uh, all right. You guys see the share thing, so if you if you see it, give it a share. Make sure that some folks can can see this thing here. Um, okay, I think we're good. I think we are. We are good. We are good. All right. Uh, that's about all of the things I'm going to get through. So, uh, all right. Let's turn off this banner and dive into it because we are. Uh, yeah, we, we've, we've got all, uh, we've got all the invites sent. Oh God, that shoulder. Um, so as you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we do a couple new stories in this live stream. We kind of ran through some of them, uh, and, uh, we got three different topics for you guys, but uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, uh, first of all, if you want to leave a comment, I highly encourage you guys leave a comment because we read them at the end. We'll put them up on the screen just like this. Uh, so we'll do some housekeeping while we're here. Uh, I got an album, uh, that is available right now on Bandcamp. It's available for a dollar, but you can stream it. You can use whatever, um, downloading thing that you like to use, but I prefer the Bandcamp. The Bandcamp gives you, uh, that plus bonus tracks for uno dollars single single dollar uh so i don't nobody's i don't want anybody to get priced out of this thing uh because we are in some you know in a pretty difficult time so that's why it's it's available for a dollar for everybody uh june shows i've got one more coming up on friday we're going to be donating to the venue on 35th 
which is, oh, excuse me, which is a um, basically a creative playground kind of kind of space. They're an amazing, amazing black box space for uh, a variety of different arts and a variety of different artists to try different things. So I was there in January. They're incredible. They're POC run. Um, and they're very community driven. So I wanted to give back to make sure that uh, they are taken care of by donating half the proceeds to them. Uh, so, uh, you know, grab your tickets and uh, hopefully you'll come back, come come hang out. Um, like I said, we're doing two in July, July 10th, July 17th. Then we're moving into August, uh, three in August, August 7th, August 14th and August 28th. Uh, I have not locked down who the per partnering uh, grassroots organizations slash venues, activist journalists are going to be for those who I'm going to be donating to for those. Uh, but I will have information about uh, all of the July and August ones pretty soon. And lastly, if you want to make a donation, you can go there, become a sustaining member, become a uh, or make a one time donation. Uh, various things you can do uh, to help out the cause there. Uh, boy, that shoulder. I, I, you realize how much you use body parts when you injure them. And uh, my shoulder is is not at 100 uh, percent, but you can you can, uh, uh, you know, um, donate, become a sustaining member. A lot of perks for becoming a sustaining member, free tickets, unreleased content, uh, that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah. So I, I hope you guys do that. Uh, but without any further ado, that's all the housekeeping. That's all the sharing. That's all the things that we needed to do. Let's dive into these stories. Our first story is going to cover uh, what we've been covering on this channel for a while. We've been talking about Minneapolis. We've been talking about police brutality. We've been talking about what's going on, what community policing is. Yesterday's show uh, that I did, uh, the virtual live stand-up comedy show that I did, surrounded ideas. Uh, like we really, we, we discussed a lot of ideas about defunding the police, what ACAB means, why we have to defund the police, the history of policing, that sort of stuff. So. Um, we have talked about it a lot. Those videos are going to be coming out in the next couple weeks. Uh, so if you're, if you're not tuned in to get, uh, updates from me, please get, make sure that you get updates from me because we dive into a lot of information. This is specifically coming in terms of, um, the, uh, uh what the city council working in, working with, uh, Black Visions Collective and Reclaim the Block is, is planning on doing. Uh, now, the website that I read the story from uh, was, I believe, the American Military News, something along those lines. Uh, and um, the American Military News. Uh, and, and at first I was like, okay, maybe this is just sort of like, you know, what's going on with the military type shit. Uh, and it's it's not... Like it's a super, super right wing site. And I can tell that they're super right wing uh, because they call the, uh, they, they call the, the protest riots. Like in the article that they're talking about, uh, this stuff is like, they call the protests riots. And I was like, oh yeah, you guys are, you guys are definitely fucking conservative as shit. Like you guys are bananas conservative. Uh, so I had to take that into account, but they did, what they did do is they did link the actual like letter that they put out, uh, about what they're going to do, um, to transform law enforcement in Minneapolis. So, uh, let's take a look at that. Uh, I have zoomed into this relatively large because, uh, because your boy's in his thirties guys. Your boy's in his thirties. He's got to wear these sunglasses because uh, 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 he's getting old. And if he doesn't, and he squints too much, uh, his eyeballs hurt. And then he gets migraines. So your boy's your boy zoomed in as much as he can zoom in. Uh, to, <laughs> like I think I maxed it out. I fucking maxed it out. You guys are just like it won't go any further. Oh no, I can do one more. Okay, uh, this might be a little bit closer than we need, but let's we'll we'll keep it here. Uh, I'm not gonna read the whereas parts. Uh, right, because because that's basically every paragraph starts with whereas, and I'm not sure why they have to do that, but I guess they have to do that. Um, this says declaring the intent to create a transformative model of cultivating safety in our city. Police violence and excessive 
Uh, use of excessive force have led to community destabilization, a decrease in public safety, and an exacerbation of racial inequalities in Minneapolis. And police use of force among is among the leading cause of death for young men of color and black people, including black women, girls, queer, trans, and non-binary folks, uh, disabled people, American Indians, immigrants, and Latinos are killed by the police at a disproportionately higher rates than their white peers. Uh, and the use of force by the Minneapolis Police Department exposes the city of Minneapolis to legal and financial vulnerability with settlements in excess of 24 millions in the past three years. Uh, so that, that part right there, that talk, that is, that is one of the things that like, um, the Minneapolis police department's union president, which is a lot of words, basically the police union president in Minneapolis. Uh, that's one of the things he bitched about. He was like, oh, they're talking about the defunding and they want to do all these things to the police. And like, don't they know, like we're underpaid and we lose all this money to like settlements because we have to pay out, you know, off. We have to pay off the people that, that get killed by these officers with this bullshit. And it's just like, dude, stop fucking murdering people. Like, do you think you can have a police department that doesn't illegally fucking murder people all the time? You know, like that, that isn't fucking trained to think that people with higher melanin in their skin are like dangerous. Maybe you shouldn't think that you're at war with your, with the people that you're supposed to protect dog, which you're not, that's not where policing comes from. Policing comes from slave patrols. So they are doing what they're actually designed to do, which is why proposals like this happen. But it's such a bullshit argument, right? To, to be like, well, we kill people on the streets and then we have to like pay money to the families instead. That's just, I mean, that's crazy pay that's crazy that's like crazy it's such a fucking bullshit crazy argument to me all right uh the university of minnesota the minneapolis park board and the minneapolis school board uh the walker minneapolis institute of art and private businesses have announced an end to their relationship and contracts with the minneapolis police department in the past two weeks not only that uh but they were uh the transport union in Minneapolis and in, in my city of Pittsburgh too, and I think various other cities as well, uh, declined to bus protesters to prison. They also declined to bus cops to protests, which is awesome. And the and that and there you go. This is a difference between a police union and a real union. Like a real union was like, fuck yeah, we stand behind you guys not carting people to prison for unnecessary and false charges and also not carting cops to protest to rubber bullet and tear gas innocent peaceful protesters and escalating the situation and the police union is like we we shouldn't have to pay for things after we murder people you guys that's just me that's mean that's mean pants fucking making us pay for illegal murder and stuff like that's the difference fucking between these two unions so i mean the, nobody wants to work with the minneapolis police department anymore because they you know uh, kill people chief uh madaria aradondo i'm sorry if i mispronounced that uh has made good faith efforts within the existing system to improve public safety for all communities in minneapolis and is a respected and integral reader in bringing forward this much needed transformation. The city of Minneapolis has taken many steps to reform the Minneapolis Police Department, including but not limited to the creation of civ a civilian oversight bodies, implicit bias, and de-escalation training for officers, prohibiting the warrior style trainings, uh, prohibiting the types of hold that led to, George, uh, led to the death of George Floyd, adoption of a duty to intervene, uh, the addition of body cameras, uh, for all officers and many more. Yeah, I mean, the warrior style training should be gone. They should immediately stop looking at uh, civilians as the enemy combatant, right? Like, we, like, that was a Nixon thing. This whole, like, starting a war, the war on drugs, the war on crime, basically the war on civilians, the war on black communities, the war on immigrants, the war on, like, we have this war attitude, hence the warrior style trainings, and, and cops are just kind of programmed to think that they're at war, that this is some kind of a war. And it's not, that's not what policing is. And getting, I mean, things like chokeholds should be fucking, that should not even be anywhere near your fucking training thing. You should not be using any of that sort of stuff, right? And even then what's, what's really gonna come out of this is like, 
now that they've they have a civilian oversight board and nobody that serves in the police should be on the civilian oversight board uh de-escalation training and and really like what what you should do to who you should call in certain situations um so i'm hoping that 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 is kind of the direction that they go once they start implementing these things the city of minneapolis has invested in public health and community safety beyond policing strategies including evidence-based violence prevention programs like next step and invested in community-based safety programs, innovative diversion and domestic violence programs in our city attorney's office and the establishment of uh, the Office of Violence Prevention to coordinate this work. The city of Minneapolis established a 911 work group to analyze 911 dispatch categories and determine whether there are opportunities to expand the city's ability to respond to those calls beyond the Minneapolis Police Department, which generated 50 ideas and six recommendations to pursue and is continuing its work uh, this year by prototyping new responses to mental health calls and reporting and further explore 911 call options beyond the Minneapolis Police Department. Yeah, when you call 911, like they shouldn't defer to the cops. Like that's what, I mean, you, the cops did not need to get called for Rayshard Brooks, period. That dude was drunk at a drive-through. Call the paramedics, make sure his blood alcohol level isn't at like a poison state. And then call one of his, like call one or two of his buddies to pick his ass up and take him home put him in bed, get him a glass of water, put the two Advils by his, by his bed. The last time I was in Muncie, uh, Muncie, Indiana, um, the owner of Be There Now, Whitney, is, is, is a great person. Uh, I enjoy his company very much. Whitney is, Whitney is a great, great dude to kind of hang out with and talk to and stuff. And, uh, and, and, and Whitney, Whitney will buy you booze and he buys me booze and I'm, I'm a little, I'm a bit of a lightweight. Uh, and you know, his, he, he has a place for artists to stay in, and his house is maybe two blocks from, uh, the venue. And, uh, and when we got there, you know, I didn't drive there. Uh, we got to his house and he, you know, was like, Hey, you're going to feel this shit in the morning and left a big ass glass of water and two Advils, and then he gave me one Advil and was like, take this so you don't suffer in the morning. Fucking, that's what we need for drunk people. That's it. We don't need cops called on them. Cops that are going to spend 45 minutes with them, determine that they're drunk, and they shoot them in the back. That's fucking nuts. That doesn't make any sense. How does that make sense? How does that make sense? It doesn't. So those 911 calls should reroute to different departments. And you know, call an ambulance. That ambulance gets there, make sure that he's okay, have somebody that knows how to deal with drunk people there, and then call one of his friends to get him home or to their friend's house, whatever it might be. You know, that's what those emergency contacts are for. You know, like those emergency contacts are like, there, there should be an option on your on your iPhone, there should be an option uh, that that says drunk emergency. You know, like who, who's your, who's your go-to person in a drunk emergency? And, you know, they look at that and they go, okay, we call, we call, you know, Ricky or Jennifer or whoever the fuck. And they come and pick you up and take you home. The adopted 2020 budget allocated $193 million to the Minneapolis Police Department, which represents over 36% of the city's general fund of $532.3 million. And is twice as much as the combined budgets for workforce development, building affordable housing, ownership, home ownership support, small business support programs, uh, environmental sustainability, race, equity, arts, culture, violence prevention, family, and uh, early childhood support, youth development, senior services, uh, lead poisoning prevention, infectious disease prevention, and protection of civil rights, which, which is basically saying, hey, we're cool with using military force to fix all of those problems. Like if, if there's lead poisoning problem, cool, let's use military force for it. If there, is there an infectious disease problem? Yeah, cool, 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 cool. Let's do the military thing first. And it's like, that's not what we need. It, 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 we need to reallocate all this stuff. You know, compartmentalize these duties. 
Uh, the murder of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020 by Minneapolis police officers is a tragedy that shows no amount of reforms will prevent lethal violence and abuse by some members of the police department against members of the community, especially black people and people of color. There's been several ideas of reform that have been tried uh, and, uh, and they don't work. It's unfortunate, it sucks, but it, they don't work. And now it's time to move forward from them which, which look, and this is like the reason why this seems so radical is because like 20 years ago, if we were like, hey, we should tra change the training courses for police, it seems like that's leading to a lot of violence. And then we fucking did. And then we were like, oh, by the way, if they like do one of these moves, like chokeholds that are banned that shouldn't be used by the cops, then these cops should go to prison. And then we did that and it's like, oh, by the way, like they're still kind of getting violent. They're still shooting people on the streets. Maybe we should look in like, but nobody did any of that sort of shit. So now we're asking for all of it because it's like, it's like 50 fucking years of doing nothing. So this is like, there's everybody's like, oh my God, it's so radical. And it's just like, it's not radical because we haven't done any of this shit. Like we presented reforms and you ignored them. George Floyd was not the only person killed by the Minneapolis police, but joins a tragically long list of names, including uh, Tysel Nelson. If I mispronounce any of these names, I'm very, very sorry. Uh, Tyson Nelson, Barbara Schneider, Fong Lee, David Cornelius Smith, Terrence Franklin, Jamar Clark, Justine Riz Riznik Demond, Thurman Blevins, Travis Jordan, Sh Shasher Fong Vu and others. Again, if I mispronounce any of those names, I'm super, super sorry. Uh, if you know how to pronounce them, feel free to leave a comment phonetically saying how to, it said phonetically, you know, organizing how to say those names. Uh, I don't like mispronouncing people's name. It's like, I, I've, I've had it done to me all my life. Even when I shorten my name, it still happens, you know? So I, I try not to mispronounce people's name. Uh, the murder of George Floyd set off a wave of protests and uprisings across the country, across the United States and across the world, and has led thousands of voices asking for change. Now, therefore, re be it resolved by the city council of the city of Minneapolis that the city council will commence a year-long process of community engagement, research, and structural change to create a transformative new model for cultivating safety in our city. Boom. You wanted to know what the fuck defunding the police actually looks like? Then here we go. This is, we're, we're doing it. We're in the process of it in Minneapolis and other cities should be picking up on this shit. We need to start doing this uh, all over the place, right? Like Pittsburgh just celebrated, uh, uh, I think it was two years ago that Antoine Rose was killed. And that cop is like, you know, fucking desk duty or whatever. Daniel Pantaleo killed Eric Garner. I want to say five or six years ago. I might be wrong about the dates. Um, it's definitely been six years since Mike Brown. Um, and where is Darren Wilson, the officer that killed him? Where's Daniel Pantaleo? Are they fired? Are they in prison? They're not. They're fucking pushing papers. That's not, you know, that's not, that reform is bullshit. Uh, the city council will come into, so yeah, so we read that part. Okay. Um, be it further resolved that the city council will engage with every willing community member in Minneapolis, centering the voices of black people, American Indian people, people of color, immigrants, victims of harm, and uh, stakeholders who have historically marginalized or underserved by our present system. Together, we will identify what safety looks like for everyone. Resolved uh, uh, that the process will, be, will, will center the role of healing and reconciliation. The process will require healers, elders, youth artists, and organizers to help uh, to, to lead deep community engagement on race and public safety. We will work with local and national leaders on transformative justice in partnerships informed uh, informed by the needs of every single block. Yeah, so it all kind of boils down to like what each community needs and then allocating the funds on, on these community-based levels rather than, oh, the whole city needs to be protected. Let's just, let's just get guys with guns on steroids with military training from the Mossad. Uh, which is where the chokehold came from. Uh, okay. Uh, be, be further resolved that decades of police reform efforts have not created equitable, 
public safety in our community and our efforts to trans uh, to achieve transformative public safety uh, will not be deterred by the inertia of existing inter institutions, contracts, and legislation. Uh, these efforts heated by the words of Angela Davis. In a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. There is a difference between that. Um, you know, it's not just enough to say, oh, I'm not racist. I have Black Lives Matter t-shirt. That's pretty cool. What, what else are you doing? Are you educating people? Are you engaging in discourse? Are you engaging in discussions? When you see, you know, these sort of racist elements in our society may it be small, may it be large. Are you speaking out about it? Are you, uh, you know, uh, uh, are, are you, are, are you, in, you know, engaging in dialogue or w what are you doing to combat this notion of racism in your society? Again, be it small or large, right? It's, it's not just enough to be like, well, I have black friends. Cool. So do I like, but I don't, I make sure that those, like my black friends are not victims of white supremacy, you know? And when they are, I fucking do like, I have to say something about it. I will say something about it. Be further resolved that tr the transformation under consideration has citywide impact and will be conducted by city council in a spirit of collaboration and transparency with all constructive stakeholder contributors, including the mayor's office, the police chief, Hennepin County, and the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. Uh, be f uh, further resolved the city council hereby creates the future of community safety work group to include staff from the Office of Violence Prevention, the Department of Civil Rights, the city, the city's co office, coordinator's office, in coordination with the uh, 911 working group, the Division of Race and Equity Neighborhood and Community Relations, and other departments. So one, report back to the council by July 24, 2020, with a set preliminary rec recommendations for engaging with specific cultural sta and stakeholder groups, the community at large, and relevant experts that can partner with the uh, city to help Minneapolis trans transition into a transformative model for cultivating community uh, safety, including budget resource, uh, resource needs estimate for the process, and regular reports to city council uh, development and present strategies for building a new model for cultivating c community safety, building on acknowledgement the the work of the Poli Police Conduct Oversight Commission, the Office of Violence Pre Prevention, the Audit Community, uh, and the 911 Work Group, and the community-based organizations, uh, including but not limited to intermediate policy changes, investment partnerships to create public health approach to community safety and support alternatives to policing, research and engagement to inform the potential creation of a new city department of community safety with a holistic approach to community safety, including a review and analysis of relevant existing models and programs and practices that could be applied, recommendations that advance the work of 911 working group and other strategies for transition uh, of the Minneapolis Police Department to alternative and more appropriate responses to community requests for identifying um, work in the city, other agencies, community partners while working to create a new public safety systems in progress. Recommendations for additional community safety strategies that build upon existing work across the city enterprise that approaches public safety through a public health lens. Boom. Uh, so this is like a mission statement is basically what it is. It's a bit of a mission statement. Um, it, it, it's basically saying this is what our plan is, right? This is how we're going to approach stuff like this. Uh, we are, we, we're not taking it willy nilly. We are being serious about what's going on out there. And it's not something like, I hate, I hate this notion where conservatives come out and they're just like, well, we're just, we're just going to get you fucking, what are you going to do when you, you, we got an emergency situation? It's like, yeah, the emergency situation, real emergency situations. Yeah. If there's like a home invasion, somebody waving a gun around, you know, threatening your life, uh, what have you, yes, we'll call the police. But for a mental health situation, domestic stuff, you know, like a person sleeping at a fucking drive through no, we don't fucking need the police in, in, to, to be anywhere near that situation. We just don't. Um and yes, it's going to take a little while to implement this because this is something new. This is something different. So give it the time that it needs. Clearly, people are taking it relatively seriously. 
Uh, there, there isn't people that are just like, okay, cops are done now. Everybody's going to be fine. Like, no, there is an oversight committee and it's all going to take some planning. It's all going to take some transition. And if these government officials aren't going to work with us, then the community is going to push back against the government officials. Uh, you know, Jacob Fry got booed out of a fucking protest, you guys, for saying that he wasn't going to be on board with this stuff, that he wanted to push some other kind of like, you know, bullshit softball reform. That's not what we need. We need true, radical, substantive change. And this is the start of true, radical, substantive change. And yes, it's going to take a little while. And yes, there are going to be bumps in the road. But those bumps are going to be worth it because there will be less of us dead in the fucking streets. Okay, uh, let's move to subject number two. Uh, Facebook wants to uh, censor the word unionize thing. So where does this come from? Uh, I read this is from The Intercept. That's where this uh, this comes from. This comes from The Intercept. Uh, they launched a thing called Workspace recently. And it's very similar to like Slack, right? It's like an office tool. And Facebook does this quite often. They introduce like Rooms, uh, which, is, which is supposed to be similar to Zoom, I guess. Um, they, uh, th their video platform is changing to the same way that YouTube does their video platforms where it like automatically starts playing stuff in the background. There's a Facebook watch thing. So they're basically trying to like monopolize internet activity. They are trying to keep you on their site for as long as they possibly can. And look, people are already on Facebook forever. Like people just, I do this shit too. I'm not saying that I'm, I'm above this. But people will just like randomly scroll through Facebook, just looking at the same posts over and over again. It's like, oh yeah, okay, that's happening. That's happening. That's happening. And that's like people are already on the site. You don't need to create all this nonsensical bullshit uh, to 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 keep more people on your fucking site. So this workplace thing is essentially like a way for people to be on Facebook while they're at work because. They basically realized, like, yeah, a lot of times, you know, we're, we're not doing shit. You know, we got to wait for these fucking reports to come through from another department and that department's too busy jacking themselves off and, or whatever the fuck. Like, I've been in a corporate environment and it's super, 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 like, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it so much. Um, but it's like, it's just, I know that environment and it's, it's very, very aggravating. And, so when you're waiting for a different department to get back to you about a thing, then yeah, we go on Facebook. Um, that's just what you do. It's like, that's like, that's like an open secret, right? It's like everybody's on Facebook at work. Okay. That's yeah, that's what we do. You know? So now they made this thing called Facebook workspace where you can just openly be on, on Facebook at work. Um, and you know, so like you don't get in trouble with the boss. There's a feature that lets administrators censor, certain things that the company might deem as controversial. And this includes the, uh, the, the example they gave was like, oh, I don't know, like if you uh, if you want to censor the word unionize uh, was the example they gave. So it's like, oh, nobody gets to see anything that says unionize. Uh, and so everybody was just like, holy shit, did Facebook just come out and say, that they don't want people to unionize like they're trying to censor anything that talks about unionization that has that's that's saying anything good about unions right and people kind of freaked out about it and it kind of makes sense because they're look who's using workspace right uh companies like walmart are using workplace the singapore government is using workplace discovery channel starbucks campbell soup all these companies use workplace and all of these companies uh, have been about union busting. They are not pro union companies, right? So they're top tier fucking um, companies that use this product are, are just fucking not, they're not, they're all union busters. So like, of course this makes sense. Uh, now Karandeep Anand, who is the uh, product developer behind Workplace, came out and apologized. And he was like, hey, uh, you know, we misspoke. We shouldn't have given that example. Uh, whoopsie daisy, everything's fine. And we're all like, but, but not really, because you just kind of put the idea out there of just, 
like other like other companies are definitely going to take that out. Like, are you shitting me? Like Walmart's one hundred percent going to take out the word unions with their from their workplace app for sure, for sure. And they already do so much for union busting. They like fucking show videos where they're just like, hey, don't join unions because a communist will come out and eat your baby. And it's just like, what? That's not even. I don't think you know how unions work. And they're like, we don't care. Communism. That's that's what it is. It's all about communism. And and America is great. Number one champion. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Roll back those prices. Here comes that weird smiley face. Like, that's, that's just what they do. So right now, there's a split within Facebook. Right? There's a split within Facebook. The, the Facebook employees, the rank and file of Facebook are pushing back against the company. Um, and, you know, uh, they're not pushing back about the company about like, who's like a better actor, right? Is, is Jesse Eisenberg a better actor or is Andrew Garfield a better actor? Uh, the answer is Garfield. Andrew Garfield, better actor than Jesse Eisenberg. Uh, you can fight about it all day. I just, it's just, yeah, I just, he's, he's fine. Jesse Eisenberg is whatever. Um, but no, they're, they're, they're talking about how Facebook is operating as a company and kind of dictating what people get to see on their platform, right? That's what they're really arguing about. And uh, the article, the Intercept article that I read, it said that they had a laissez-faire approach to political, co to political content, which is super not true. Like, they're very strict about making sure that certain political content doesn't get shown to certain people, right? Like, um, there's there's a ton of stories about, like, my friend Lee Camp. My friend Lee Camp hasn't broken 36, 336,000 people on his Facebook page uh, because every time some a new person likes his page, somebody else gets taken off, and it just, it just won't let him grow his page any further than that. Um, so it's like they don't have a laissez-faire approach to, to, to data censorship. Like they have a very hard lined approach to it. Um, uh, I can't remember exactly what it, but it was like 2018, 2019, somewhere within that range. Uh, I think it was roughly seven or 800. I don't know the numerics exactly. Uh, but a bunch of like alternative media pages just snap disappeared overnight. They didn't get a warning. They didn't break any community standard fucking rules or anything, right? They just disappeared. And it was left wing and right wing, but they were not CNN. It wasn't Fox News or MSNBC. They were like alternative news sites that are kind of powered by the people, right? They work on donations and sustaining memberships very similarly to, to me. So when that happened, I was just like, holy shit, is that going to happen to me? Because, like, I don't have a huge page or anything, but, you know, it is scary to think about because you're like, holy shit, is this going to happen to me? And, uh, you know, it they, 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 like, just disappeared. If you look at the Cambridge Analytica leaks, that proved that they're selling data and they're manipulating data for political campaigns. The Cambridge Analytica leaks basically found out that an American billionaire paid a British company that worked with Facebook to manipulate people's votes. That's what happened. That's what Cambridge Analytica proved. The Cambridge Analytica leaks proved, right? Uh, and, and we still, I mean, there's, there's barely anybody that fucking talks about this still. They don't have a laissez-faire approach to politics. They like certain stories. They want certain things. What keeps people on the site is not intelligent discourse and conversation, but rather people going up against the throats. So the more divisive you can be as a uh, as a commentator or or a news site or or what have you, the better it is for fucking Facebook. Um, so you know that's the kind of stuff that they want. So. If I'm trying to sit here and have this conversation about like, hey, here's the information that we have, and this is what we, this is what I can can extrapolate from this, and this is where I, the hypothesis that we can make. Let's have a discussion about it. They don't want that kind of shit. They want me to come out and and be like, Facebook is trying to kill unions. They're coming in 
and they're using their robots. The robots are coming in there and they're punching union members in the dick. And then they're punching union presidents uh, up the urethra. That's what they're doing. They're using their urethra punching robots. And, and then everybody's like, what? This is crazy. You know, and then there's a battle between, and that keeps people more engaged in the site. They want that kind of shit. They want more divisiveness. So any channel that doesn't promote that kind of divisiveness that, that, and, and speaks about facts and calls them out on their own bullshit and doesn't, uh, you know, kind of addresses the technocracy for what it is, they get deleted off the site. They also have a, a program, this is fucking hilarious. They have a program called American Edge, uh, which is a dark money venture that's supposed to be more forceful on lawmakers about regulation to Facebook itself. Which is fuck nuts to me. It's fuck nuts. Like, how crazy is that? You have a dark called American Edge. Uh, this is the American Edge. Like, how macho shit do you need to be? <laughs> but this is what they are, man. They're a company that's, that, you know, they're, they're trying to make money and they're trying to control data. That's what they're doing. And they, uh, they don't want democratization in the workplace. Because if now, if people are scrolling through Facebook at work and a company that they've partnered with is like, hey, we don't want people to see you shit about unionization we don't want people to see things about bernie sanders we don't want people to see things about socialism um or whatever or third parties uh or anything from fox news or anything from a conservative site i mean this that censorship in on a massive massive scale and facebook gets to allow them to do that it, it lets other corporations do that so then then corporations can basically pay facebook to give them more authoritarian control over what people get to see and don't see on Facebook. So, uh, yeah, keep your eye out on that. Our final topic is, uh, is, is another race related topic. Uh, this is an article from the verge and, uh, it talks about, um, uh, what's going on in academia and, you know, this this is not extremely surprising to me, but it is something that uh, I think we should all be aware of, uh, and that is uh, black scientists call out racism in their institution. This is this is from uh, this is from The Verge, uh, and uh, we're going to read through this article to the best of our ability. Okay, uh, it says uh, a reckoning has come this week for systematic racism. When was this written? Uh, this was written. June 11th, so just a couple of days ago, about a week, week, week and a half ago. Black scientists and students are sharing their experiences on Twitter of being dismissed and discriminated against in academia using the hashtags, hashtag black in the ivory. Uh, many also participate in a June 10th strike meant to shut down this, shut down STEM industries in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. Thousands of tweets detailing what it's like to be black in the ivory towers of universities and research institutions point to deep-seated problems. Tweet after tweet describes similar horrifying experiences from individuals spread across the world. Some leading institutions, including academic journals, are now taking steps towards ending systemic exclusion, exploitation, and belittling black scholars. Quote, uh, we always try to separate science from these kinds of things, as if science is not at all impacted by racial bias and racist histories and that's just the biggest fabrication you could be telling anyone these days uh says alex moore a postdoctoral researcher at the american museum of natural history she joined the strike yesterday uh, and says her workplace was supportive in her decision it matters a lot to me to see scientists and academic institutions saying that we are not separate from these issues. Uh, and then here's Alex's treat being hashtag black in the ivory means everyone having means having everyone believe you were only accepted to meet a diversity quota until you start to believe it yourself. Imposter syndrome is racial trauma for black and brown students. 
that's kind of that's kind of crazy fucked up to me like that level of you know like she's talking about imposter syndrome and i don't know if i particularly experienced that but i've definitely felt like like i've i've been on some shows or i've been part of like groups and i've definitely felt like not particularly uh, a part of the group, but I'm there for like a reason, and 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 that's probably the closest that I've had. But that's that's so. I mean, that's fucked up. Uh, that's really really fucked up to do. It you know is like to treat somebody like they're a diversity hire is. Uh, I, that, but that, you know, and that's also is like you're you're using your own fucking insecurity about yourself and your place in in academia and the sciences to belittle somebody else to make yourself feel better when it's like no 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 but you two should collaborate and build each other up like why aren't we doing that more? Okay, uh, academic in institutions participating in the strike include the American Physical Society, the Journal Science, the Journal of Physical Review Letters and the preprint servers ARXIV, uh, among others. The goal of the strike is to push institutions to consider how they've marginalized black people and take steps to do better. It's also time to prioritize the needs of black people in STEM, whether that is to rest, reflect, or to act without incurring additional cumulative damage, according to the strike organizers. Nearly 6,000 scientists signed to participate. Wow, that's amazing. Um, the, the journal Nature decided to only publish content on the day of the strike that is directly relevant to supporting black researchers uh, or that amplifies their voices. Referring to stories on social media, the journal said in an editorial, the outpouring is in part because black researchers have long denied a space and platform in established institution and publications such as this one. And we recognize that Nature is one of the white institutions that is responsible for bias in research and scholarship. The enterprise of science has been and remains complicit in, in systemic and, and it must strive harder to correct those injustices. Uh, my only, my hope in this is that they, they continue to do this in some way, shape or form. Um, I love seeing that sort of stuff, but I want it to carry on forward. Right, like the whole support black businesses movement. It's like, okay, we're going to support black movement, support black businesses on Saturday, June twentieth, and then everybody is like, yeah, woo, and then they all go and support their favorite black business, and then they don't see that black business for the rest of the year. And it's just like, oh, remember that thing we did on on June twentieth? That was nice, huh? We gave you guys like uh, twenty five bucks. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. We bought a we bought a poster. We hang up and we talk about it. We talk about how we helped. We help the poor blacks. It, that's that's not helping. That's you, you know, I, I don't know, touting how much money you have. It's this condescending way of uh, of treating the black community. No, you need, like, are you going to be continuing that sort of stuff? So if I hope nature continues to amplify the voice of black scientists and their research and why their work is important, make sure that they are in, you know, if they are heads of their research, then you include them in the, you, you put them as a focus in the article. They should be the focus of the article. Okay, uh, the injustices are innumerable. Many scientists use the hashtag, hashtag black in the ivory described being mistaken for a janitor or a housekeeper. Quote, at a fellowship induction ceremony, the woman at the door greeting the white student in front of me for their name so they could retrieve their name tag and then ask me if I was the help. I went back to my dorm and sobbed until I vomited. The University of North Carolina PhD candidate, Maya Roberson tweeted. This is like cartoonish racism to me. And it's, and I know it exists, right? Like I'm not trying to discount what happened. I believe that this fucking happened. It's just every time it happens, I'm just like, you're a, you're not a, you're a fucking cartoon person. Like, how are you, how are you this racist? 
whether it's whether it's conscious or unconsciously like this is the type of shit that you see in like a, a you know a lifetime movie produced by oprah winfrey you know and they're just like are you the help and it's like i'm i'm actually the detective or whatever the fuck it is is like that's but that and that's that moment it's crazy to me that this woman had to fucking live that it's so wild like ugh. I'm getting a little I'm getting a little hyped up, but when I read it, I, I got a little hyped up in my own mind. I was robbed of that joy and that felt like I deserved uh I, I was sorry, I'm gonna restart that whole the whole quote here. Uh I was robbed of the joy that I felt like I deserved. And even beyond that, I don't think that that's an appropriate way to greet anyone regardless of their role which is yeah which is yes you should not be like oh are you the help like who the fuck does that even if they are go hi how, how's it going uh is your name on the list how can i help you oh and they go oh i'm actually here to do this other thing it's like oh yeah yeah you know what let me figure out where to go to get a thing it's like why would you make an assumption like that you fucking cartoon villain what a, like it's so i and i know this stuff happens i know this stuff happens it's just it's unfathomable like i can't wrap my head around the the decision that a human being has to make with their brain and all of these experiences that we see in the world around us and then go oh black person maybe help what how 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 it's so crazy to me like i can't i can't put the fucking pieces together <laughs> <laughs> like I just can't do it. I know I'm hung up on it a little bit, uh, but I just I just can't fucking put the pieces together, you guys. It it's 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 it drives me fucking banana sandwiches to fucking see that sort of shit. Uh, okay. Uh, others describe being hassled by security guards or having the police called on them on their campus or at their places of work. For okay. Uh, once again, I apologize if I mispronounced this next name. Um, if you know how to pronounce it, please feel free to leave a comment about how to phonetically pronounce it. Okay. For Naoma Adaku, uh, being black in the ivory tower meant having a security guard call police on her five years ago while she was working in a lab at Yale. Uh, she, sa she says she reported the incident to administration, but ultimately began using a different entrance to the building to avoid the same security guard. Adaku is now an MD PhD candidate at Rockefeller University researching mechanisms of cancer metastasis and also participated in yesterday's strike, the June, uh, June 10th strike. Like that's so nuts to me. I don't know. I don't know if I was fortunate or not. Um, although, no, I mean I went to a pretty, pretty, pretty diverse uh, college. I went to a relatively diverse college, but you know that was the thing is like, I caught myself at one point doing that because there were there were two black kids in my graphic design program. Um, and they were very talented in what they, and they had a, they had a much different style because it wasn't as clean and precise as everybody else's, um, or it wasn't as decorative as some of the other people. Like my head doesn't work in, like my head didn't work the same way that, that theirs did. Right. And in my, for, for a minute, I know I had this bias and I caught myself with that bias uh, and you know, like I, I got to talk to them and learn about them and who they are, where they come from and everything started to click. And I was like, oh, this is, I've, I think I've been, I, I might've accidentally fucking had my own biases and made a judgment call out of it, but I didn't do the fucking crazy thing that that lady did at that inauguration. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't fucking, oh, are you guys the help? Like, no. Uh, I, that was a shitty moment for me, but I wanted to, I learned from that moment. 
and I got, and I worked on a project with them and it's actually like, it's one of my favorite projects is we, um, I work with, I work, I'm, I don't want to, you know, say any names unless you, because I don't, I don't know if they want to be publicly identified or whatever, but I work with one of them, uh, w one of these, these black students and, uh, you know, um, his, his idea was fun. I sometimes forget to do that. Like I talk about it in my albums, like I'm not a fun person. I, I, t I tend to end up being a little bit more serious for a comedian, right? It's like, go, no shit. Um, but his idea was just fun. And then once I kind of dove into that, we started bouncing ideas back and forth and like how to film it and stuff. Um, and, and he, you know, some of the technical aspects, like he wasn't, he wasn't very big on, but you know what he did? He learned about it. And he sat behind me and was like, what are you doing there? How are you doing that? What's that tool do? Oh, how are you handling this? Oh, you're shrinking this time scale. And then not only that, but he was also in the, like, he was also like the actor in the commercial, which he fucking nailed it too. Uh, it's, it was pretty like, but again, it's like my own biases when I was a freshman versus when I was like a junior, like I would have not worked with him the same way. Uh, and the whole point was to work with different people because we had all gotten used to like working with the same people. So I turned to him and I was like, Hey, let's do the project together. And I don't think I would have done that if I had my, if, if I continued to have my bias, I, like, I don't think so. Um, and you know, it's like, I, I, I don't know if I skip that or not, but anyway, sorry if I can went off on a weird tangent. Uh, black scientists also share experiences of being told by other students or coworkers that their presence was due to diversity in the institution and not because of merit. Uh, that happened to Tracy Edwards when she was an in intern at Vanderbilt University. She's a nuclear physics PhD student at Michigan State University now. Uh, I got into my own merit and my own credit, and for someone to just reduce that down to my race is, is a complete insult. Yes, one fucking hundred percent. One fucking hundred percent. In the entertainment world, that kind of happens all the time. Is like the only time that they'll hire, they'll they'll put up, uh, you know, certain black comics or certain brown comics on stage is when it's a all brown show or an all black show or an all female show or whatever, and these themed token shows. Um, I don't know. I I I end up having mixed feelings about them, but. They, they feel tokenized to me. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm being honest with you. I got so tired of hearing these stories of black scientists being pushed out of STEM. Edward says only 9% of STEM workers in the U.S. are black compared to 69% who are white. According to the Pew Research, black males and black females each made up about 2% of full-time professors in 2017, according to the National Center of Education Statistics. It feels like an academia, you're just not welcome. So that's why I've taken to Twitter. Uh, yeah, which is like, that's where, <laughs> sometimes it's where you gotta go. Uh, things that are caught on camera that are physically abusive and egregious are terrible, but they are real, but, but we are unable to really grasp and acknowledge the covert racism that happens. Uh, and when you see that sort of stuff, that's the shit that you're supposed to call out. That's that's part of being anti-racist. Uh, uh, th and that was a quote by Joy Melody Woods, a doctoral student at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Woods started the hashtag Black in the Ivory uh, hashtag along with uh, Sh Chardre Davis, PhD and assistant professor of communications at the University of Con Connecticut. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, Woods says the momentum user hashtag has garnered uh, online is evolving into specific demands for universities and other institutions. We're calling for structural radical change uh, for institutions that perpetuate white supremacy. Uh, the social media campaign and STEM strike are playing alongside with worldwide protests against racism and the deaths of black people at the hands of police. It's only people of privilege who have that notion that science is separate from these societal issues because uh, as black scientists, we're not given the same ability to separate our specific scientific lives outside 
uh, or, and our lives outside science, Adaku's tells The Verge. Uh, what people are comfortable with sharing on social media barely scratches the surface of the abuse within science and academia, others, others tweeted. Black students were fed up, Wood says. Black people as a whole are fed up in the country right now uh, of racism. Boom. Yeah, I think there's an implicit bias based on how the the media portrays black people, how we are we are told to think about black people. Uh, I've been guilty of it. Fortunately, I was able to uh, f look at my guilt and um, learn from it and and move forward from it. Um, and I hope other people do too. Like, I, I mean, I, I know I fucked up a, a couple times, but the point is that you realize that you fucked up, you apologize for it and you, you, you grow as a person. That's the important thing. These institutions that come out and make these apologies and they go, oh man, that's crazy. Like we didn't, you know, I know people in academia. I know tons of people in academia and being a woman in academia is not great either. It's the same thing. It's like they, they don't take you seriously. They're just like, oh, you're diversity hire. You were hired because you're tits, baby, or whatever the fuck, you know. And I'm thinking about it in my, in, in my own college experience, right? Out of my entire school, there was one Indian professor who was part of the interior design department and one black professor that I can remember. His name was Augustus Brown. He, Dr. Augustus Brown. Uh, he was my art history teacher and he was one of the coolest fucking people I've ever met in my life. He was awesome. He was so fucking cool. Uh, I love that dude. And I got to see that dude once in a Panera randomly. And then I sat, I stood there and talked to him for like 15 minutes. And then he looked at me uh, and he said, uh, he was like, I got to get some lunch. I can sit here and talk to you all day, but I got to get me some lunch. I've been looking forward to some broccoli cheddar soup. I love the broccoli cheddar soup. And then we shook hands and he got his broccoli cheddar soup and I went home. I was very happy. I was having, a, I was kind of having a shit day and I was very happy. Um, I, I think I was actually applying for a job at Panera at that point. Uh, cause I, cause I was like, I just, I needed like a different job or some shit. I don't know. Uh, but I was like not feeling great. And I, and then I saw Dr. Brown and, uh, and boy, it was a fucking great day. Actually, this is, um, I've been meaning to do something with this, but this is, is my art history notebook. And this was part of the way that Dr. Brown would help you learn. So you make this notebook, right? You use drawings and you make timelines and stuff like this. And there's a lot of this stuff that like, I kind of still remember, you know, like you do these papers, here's all these notes that I took. And he gave you carte blanche and like how to organize it, how to, how to, how to design it and be creative and all this other stuff. And, uh, he was just super fucking encouraging, but, that's the only black teacher I had four years of college. That's the only black teacher I had, uh, which to me is kind of crazy, but I, 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 but I think that's the point in academia is I think intellectualism is, is co-opted by the white supremacy movement in saying that, and this goes back to like old race science type shit. Uh, it, you know, in basically saying that black and brown people are not intelligent. Um, which is also this weird thing because brown people are, like Indian people specifically, are touted for their intelligence. But we become the good minority, the model minority, right? We become that model minority. Oh, look, they're intelligent and their intelligence is gonna be used to benefit us. So, so we get, we, there's this weird, roundabout way of 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 utilizing brown people in the world of academia even though we're not really a part of the world of academia as much like we're still a we're still a major minority in the world of academia as is my understanding same thing with black people the black people the the intellectualization of black people is not seen as something um to be coveted uh or or if you do see an intellectual black person uh such as a cornell west 
it seemed like an anomaly. They're just like, well, this, this guy's different. He's probably, he probably hung out with some white people. You know, that's where he learned it from. It's like shit like that. And it's like, no, no. Most of the cool shit has been invented by black and brown people. The foundations are invented by black and brown people. <laughs> Uh, the foundations of science are invented by black and brown people. My closer on my album is about the number zero that comes from India. Like, so, yeah, I think that is that is a uh, the 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 level of intellectualism credited or discredited to black and brown communities. I think is a form of white supremacy, probably. Um, not even probably it is. And, uh, and then there's, there's, and then it kind of gets mucked up even more, right? Because then there's this whole big thing of like championing anti-intellectualism. Like people like being anti-intellectual. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, you got to be dumb because if you're smart, you're a fucking nerd and nerds get their underwear pulled up or whatever the fuck it is, right? It, so it, this, this notion that like, look, academics are already beaten up enough, right? So why are you adding racism into it? But it's another way to devalue communities of color. Uh, so if you see that shit in your community, if you're an academic that, that, that watches this show and you see that shit in your community, you got to call it out. And you got to stop participating in it. Okay, I think that is the show. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, a, uh, well, I'll do. I'll be doing another live stream again tomorrow, uh, and uh, I have no idea what the topics are yet. I haven't. I haven't gotten around to, to picking those out yet. I'm. I'm hoping that I'll. I'll be able to do them in the afternoon, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to do something on Monday evening as well. Um, but uh, I've got the Citizen Revolution show coming up on uh, on um, Friday. Uh, it's the last one of June. We're donating to venue on 35th in Norfolk, Virginia. So grab your tickets, come hang out. I, uh, the plan right now, if I'm, if I'm going to, if I'm thinking about it properly is to talk about, uh, general strikes. That's going to be the topic of discussion because it's been on, on, I mean, it's been on everybody's mind for a long time, I think. Uh, and then we'll be moving on to July. Um, haven't particularly picked out a lot of those topics. Uh, or the grassroots organizations yet, but I will be making announcements about that soon. Uh, I am going to be taking the weekend of 4th of July off because your boy needs a break. <laughs> uh, so grab these tickets. The, the links are in the description there uh, uh, of, of the video. They're also in the comment sections as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can make a donation, become a sustaining member. Sustaining members get free tickets to those shows I talked about. They also get a free copy of my album, Politely Angry, which is available for a dollar. Uh, yeah, so there's, uh, yeah, the easiest way is to go to my website, krishmohan.com, uh, go there and, uh, and, and you can find all this stuff there. So, uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you guys for checking it out. Make sure you hit the like, make sure you hit the share, make sure you get the word out about this stuff and make sure you're, uh, set to get notifications from me, uh, uh, about when I put these videos up. Uh, but that's it for today. Thank you so much. And we'll see you on the road. Bye.